colleagues if we can go through uh, consent calendar and items uh, 8, 9, 10, 13, and 15. Did you say 10? 10, yes. And for the clerk, if we could just add on item 10, if we could get with the uh, CAO and CLA and provide a timeline as to uh, when the consulting firm will complete uh, their analysis, when the CAO and CLA will uh, evaluate that analysis, and then when that those that those two reports will be forthcoming to council committee, so we can get that timeline placed in item 10. Uh, also, on item 13, we just like to add a note that uh, if we can encourage council offices to post these reports on their website uh, for public information on the use of the general purpose funds. And then on item 15, uh, just a note that the city attorney advises that they could complete this uh, brief that's requested by internal personnel and there is no need for outside counsel. So if we can move those four items. So moved. Okay. All right, the next, uh, before we go in closed session, do we have the commissioner here on item three? Okay. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, Mr. Barwell? Barwell, yes. yes. Sir, would you just give us an overview? Uh, you look like from your uh, resume that you have extensive background in dealing with pensions, a variety of parts of pensions in the city. If you give us a background as to uh, what your qualifications are to sit on the L.A. City Employee Retirement System. As to relative experience, I would indicate that <clears throat> I was the chief accounting officer for LACERS. Uh, after that, I was the cash management officer for the city treasurer's office. I went from there. I was the investment officer for the Fire and Police Pension Fund. I was then became the assistant general manager of the retirement system, and later I was the general manager of the retirement system for eight years. Okay. And then let me ask you: Have you reviewed uh, uh, Charter Section 202 regarding potential and conflicts of interest? I have. <clears throat> okay. uh, do you see any uh, relevant information in those in that charter section that may impact your ability to serve? I do not. Okay. And then it, you, I'm sure, have read the letter from the uh, ethics uh, department, and they've set some criteria that uh, if you're recused, I believe, three times uh, in a year, that uh, they would uh, have to meet with you regarding some issues of conflict. I'm familiar with that provision. Okay. Very good. And so is there anything else you'd like to share with us about uh, your uh, recommendation by the mayor to become a member of LACERS? It's just that I would make the point that I've been retired for some while. I really didn't plan to come back, but the mayor uh, called and asked me to serve. I felt that I should do that. And I also feel that these are difficult times for pension departments, and I think I can make a contribution and that I should make a contribution, and I'd be pleased to do so. From your experience, uh, from your prior position, and I may mispronounce this uh, with the uh, uh, R-L-A-C-E-I. Yes. Does that, uh, those issues ever come before LACERS? Uh, I, would, I would just point out that uh, I indicated to the mayor that I will resign my position as treasurer of that organization, and I'll, I will also resign as a director of that organization if this appointment is successful, and I'd make that same recommend, uh, representation to the committee this morning. I just, uh, as I read over your resume, it looks like you're eminently qualified and kind of the kind of person we need over there. Uh, I, I just wonder if you give me any of your viewpoints from uh, afar, if you would, 
where you think we need to be looking at as we look at the pension system on a go-forward basis as to make it actuarially sound? Well, I think there are several proposals on the table today relative to restructuring the benefit structure for the plan. LACERS, as you know, is involved in administering benefit plans. We don't structure plans. But I think the proposals that are on the table are thoughtful ones, and the ones I've seen, most of them would actually reduce the cost to the system. But as a board member of LACERS, I would not be a particular advocate for any one of those proposals, because we would eventually have to administer whatever benefit plan that was established. But we do look to the LACERS board for input, and some of the stuff you actually have to approve, we don't approve. So we would always be looking to have an open mind toward any of these restructuring issues as we go forward to keep the system sound so that those employees can look forward to a pension system that's sound when they get there, and the new employees that are coming in are going to have a system that is as good as we can make it, realizing that probably the system we have today is not going to be the one that we offer new employees in the future. So we just want to make sure that you have an open mind to those concepts as we go forward in this very troubling year that we're going to see. Well, I think what can be effectively done in that respect is a restructuring of the benefits. If you increase the contributions, if you delay the time at which participants are eligible for our pensions, if you go to a defined contribution plan, all of those and other proposals that are on the table would probably lower the cost of the system. And they're up for discussion, and as you indicate, LACERS would be a part, a resource for those who have to make those decisions, but the actual benefits would probably be determined in the meet and confer process, not by the LACERS board. Some of those and some, but also some of the administration concepts such as smoothing and corridors and all those issues are issues that you have to decide on, not us. Yes, yes, you do. And I think there's more to be done in that respect because I think the present system, which demands more from the city when the city is the least able to pay, is probably not the best way to go, and some sort of counter-cyclical funding process is something that ought to be looked into. Very good. Excellent. Thank you very much. All right. Just want to welcome in your nomination. Your background is the type of background that's needed on this board, and so we look forward to working with you. And please do not hesitate to let this committee or any council member know about anything we should be looking at as we move forward in reforming our pension systems. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Yeah, I also appreciate the long history you have in these areas, and I think that brings the kind of wisdom that we need. We are, as you all, everybody knows, the most difficult governmental situation since the Great Depression, and the issues are phenomenally difficult to wade through. So we're looking forward, you know, to your support. I read in the paper this morning that 401Ks have bounced back somewhat. Do you have a sense of how that market did bounce back? I know we're at about 10,600. Yeah. Has it changed this whole business of the pension funds or the retirement funds? Has it had an impact? Well, since the market low in March, we've had something close to a 50 percent recovery. Yeah. Now, I don't know how that has affected 401Ks, but I'm sure it has helped and helped considerably, but we're still not back to where we were before, as you know. If you lose 50 percent and then you gain 50 percent, you're not back to 100, you're back to 75. The mathematics of losses is brutal, and that's sort of where we are. We've had a very good recovery, but starting from the point where we started the loss, we're not back to where we should be, and quite frankly, I think it will be a market recovery that will get us back to where we want to be. Yeah, I agree, and I appreciate your comment that we should put all this stuff on the table and discuss through it. It's not going to be easy, but I appreciate you saying that. Not at all. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. We're going to move your nomination to the council. Do we have that scheduled? Next Tuesday, January 19th. All right. Thank you very much for serving. I look forward to seeing you in council. Colleagues, one item also, item two, if there are no specific cases that you'd like to discuss in closed session, we can also move that item on consent. And that deals with the 
routine report on liability. Okay, so we'll move item two. I would just bring to the attention of the committee that there's some footnotes there that identify that we have deferred some of these payments in future fiscal years just so that we not miss that. But we'll move item two on consent. Mr. Weissman, I missed your card on item ten. We dealt with it on consent. If you'd like to come up and speak now. And also you have a card for public comment. If we can give him three minutes for the two cards. And then you have two cards remaining. Then we'll go in closed session on item one. Thank you very much for the courtesy, sir. Yesterday a very important meeting was held by the Los Angeles Neighborhood Council Coalition. There were 80 people there as participants. They represented 42 of our 89 or 90 neighborhood councils. There was representation from the mayor's office, from one of the council members who stayed for the full meeting, Mr. Koretz, from the controller's office and our general manager for Dunn. This meeting, which I've given you a copy of some material, was focused on the budget. The members present were fully aware of how difficult this budget is, how much the cash flow has been limited, and how severe the future looks to all of us. At the same time, they offered everything that they could to you, the decision makers, in an effort to try to offer their expertise, which is very wide and very broad and very deep, to partner with you in this process. In order to do that, as I said before the council on Friday, I believe that we're going to have to have a whole different relationship between neighborhood council and the decision makers, the 18 electeds and department heads, in which we have a seat at the table. When these important issues come forward, rather than two minutes of public comment, which always get truncated and just are completely inadequate, we have a lot of information to bring to you. We neighborhood council representatives are part of city government. We're the only part of city government that doesn't sit at the table when issues that concern it are brought forward. I would encourage and invite each and every one of you. I'd love to meet with each and every one of you on the budget matters soon. I know many others in our neighborhood council activist group would like to do that as well in order to further this. The challenges before us look very, very bleak, and we're going to have to work very, very hard to do this. Now, with that, I'm going to move to the other issue, which is item number 10. And item number 10 is the possible agreement with the PA Consulting on the ECAF. There has been community impact statements delivered to you, and I've been one of the people who've done that. The ECAF is a very hot issue for Department of Water and Power, but even hotter are the reports that the Huron Company and the PA Company have been promoting and putting forward. May I continue just to one more sentence? Thank you, sir. Their reports have been faulted, have been faulty, have been too sudden, and have not addressed the real issues. We neighborhood council people through the DWP MOU and MOU and the DWP committee, of which I'm a member, have voiced our opinions, and I am sorry to say our opinions have not been heard. The reason that this is forward is because when the idea of the ECAF changes came forward, I asked you to put a 245 on the table. That was the first Friday in April, excuse me, in August, and I was amazed that it came forward before I was finished speaking. Thank you for doing that, but I do ask you to deal with the neighborhood council's views when issues like this come forward. I must now say thank you to Mr. Kortz for attending our meeting yesterday. And I can't count. You're quite right. Mr. Rubenthal has a question for you. Yeah, a question for you. Yes, sir. 
I'm a big believer of neighborhood councils. I've empowered them and I support them. My one problem is the definition of a stakeholder. I'm elected by registered voters, and I am a vessel for the democracy as we've created in the United States of America. Registered voters participate. In neighborhood councils, they're not necessarily registered voters or even live in that district. I'm offended by that definition. I have nothing to do with it. I wasn't on the council. So there's a limited amount of support I give to neighborhood councils within the traditional sense of being part of government. True, there's Brown Act. True, they get some money each year to do things with. And true, they deal with all the issues that exist. But my problem is historic of how some neighborhood councils have certain types on it that are not registered voters or don't live in the district. How do you address that issue, though I respect neighborhood councils? I'd love to do that here. It's a matter that you and I have discussed before and I think is an important set of differences between our opinions. The neighborhood, to do it as quickly as I can, the neighborhood councils do not have the responsibility that you do. We have the responsibility to represent everyone in the community, to represent not only those who live in the area, not only those who are registered in the area, but those who may be visiting the area, whether they're visiting legally or illegally. And therefore, the definition, which I am very pleased to have, is, I believe, very appropriate. It means that people who do not live in the area can represent their area. I am one of those people. I've done that in several neighborhood councils. I don't live in West Hills, but I'm on the West Hills board. I've taken an active interest in that area. I've actively tried to help my community in that area, as well as other communities across the city. The idea that you have to live in a community, you have to be... uh, A registered voter in the community, I think, is inappropriate for neighborhood council stakeholders. Live, work, or own property, or affirm an interest in the community and a factual basis for that affirmation. I had to explain that to the city clerk's office when I went to apply to uh, as candidate for the next year's election in my community. And it took him a little while to take a look and agree that that is the way Our law reads right now, but more important, I think that's the way it should be. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, We have one other public comment, Dr. Williams, before we go to a closed session. Dr. Clyde Williams, you had a public comment card. General public comment. Uh, DWP has recently used the agreement with the IBEW that was approved by the City Council as a leverage to increase the costs of management, dispatchers, and something called confidential managers. Because since the IBEW got it, hey, maybe we should apply it to everybody. Again, about 15 to 20 percent increase over the next three years in this budget fiscal crisis. Uh, pensions, bonded indebtedness, all of these things are adding up to one thing. We're going to get hit with either property tax or property fees, as the urban stormwater tried to do. And we're quite concerned because, for me, it means about $2,000 a year if you take a billion dollars and divide it amongst the million plots, parcels that are available within the city of Los Angeles, it works out to $1,000 a year per plot for maybe the next three years. That's a huge amount for anyone. And what will it mean to the city of Los Angeles? Uh, We in the neighborhood councils, and I'm a member of the LA32 Neighborhood Council, we're trying to help people understand what it's going to be. And I say last year was easy. And I saw the CEAO and the CLO uh, presentations. And it was the first time that I ever heard the city council being absolutely dead silent and listening attentively to the speakers. So I would highly recommend that we incorporate the neighborhood councils, anyone that can help in this fiscal crisis. Thank you. Thank you very much. 
Before we go to closed session, Ray, let me ask you, one of our last meetings before we took the break, there was a discussion about bringing forth a presentation to this committee regarding the impact on litigation and liability. When do you think that would be available where the city attorney was asked to be a part of it? And also, I think we looked at the major, the top 90 percent departments during the budget process. I think we're looking to come back in the next 30 days or so. Thank you. We're going to go to closed session for item number one. Consent items that we dealt with before going into closed session, so our next item. Our next item is item number four, which is the city controller's report relative to budgetary cash flow. Good afternoon. I'm Bill Lamb from the controller. The controller is committed to providing updates on a regular basis with respect to the salary account this year. Effective with pay period 11, we were $85 million above what the projected expenditures were for the salary account. This compares to $49 million through pay period six. Many of the items that have been adjusted are only, we're only beginning at this period. Coalition furloughs, 2 percent to 6 percent retirement, police and coalition overtime restrictions, as well as the employee retirement incentive program. There is a caution, however, that some of the savings that are being realized are not general fund savings. They're special purpose fund savings, so that those savings will be offset by money coming into the general fund, so there is no general fund reduction to deal with that. At this point, we're approximately $94 million above the budget, and we're starting to look at revenue, look at our cash flow across the board to come up with an idea of where we're going to be at the end of the year and the impact on the reserve fund. But in your report, you also mentioned that there's other savings that will kick in during the fiscal year. Correct. Any projections of, as they kick in, what we'll realize during the fiscal year? We're trying to deal with that right now. For example, of the 47 people who are off the books in December 7th on the ERIP, 17 of those were from airports and rec and parks, so they don't directly affect the general fund. Of the 30 that remain, probably a third are special purpose funds, so they don't affect the general fund. So that's what we're trying to come up with now, is working with the CAO to come up with a mechanism to identify how much of the savings are true savings to the general fund and how much appear to be savings. Let me, this may be a question for both the controller and the CAO. With the expectation of, I guess, another $19 billion shortfall in the state, where do we see that impacting us? And is that, have they identified what funds that may be shorted, or are they looking at other areas to address their $19 billion shortfall? They're looking at a number of areas. I think the two, the biggest area that we're concerned about is basically in the transit funding, basically with our gas tax and Prop 42. The governor had proposed sort of a, I don't want to call it a gimmick, but a scheme in the sense that he's reducing the sales tax on fuel and then replacing that with an excise tax that plays into basically how our gas tax and Prop 42 revenues are attributed to us. We're still assessing whether or not we're actually going to lose anything or not. Was it giving more flexibility of the use of the money? For them at the state level, yes. And it might be a way for them to get around the Prop 1A protections. So that's the biggest area. We are looking at some of the other areas that may impact us. I think we're concerned about some of the aging programs. 
Uh, we're still trying to get assessment on some of the, the comp grants and, and some of those public safety type uh, grants and find out whether we're um, going to get hit or not. Uh, but like I said, the biggest area is really the, the transit, transportation area. Okay. And then what about uh, any more sense of where all this puts us on our bond rating? <laughs> Are we, have we just given up on bond rating? <laughs> <laughs> Well, let's just say uh, as we um, are looking uh, at putting together uh, the next uh, financial status report, looking at where we are this year, looking at our potential reserves, um, the, the continued declines in revenues, uh, we don't believe we're going to uh, end the year we, where we had originally anticipated. Uh, we're looking at probably a close to a, a $200 uh, million dollar shortfall plus in the current year. Uh, and if you look at our current reserves, uh, if we get the fire hydrant money, we have the SPRF, um, you, you, that's a roughly about 228. Subtract 200 from that, you're down to about 25 to 30 million uh, at year end. Uh, and that's assuming we don't get hit by the state um, and we're willing to make uh, a couple of tough decisions on what we're going to do for the remainder of this year. So in, in sort of addressing your question, with no reserve, uh, sir, Obviously, it's going to make it very difficult for us to go to the market and try to get a trans. Uh, this is certainly going to affect our pension retirement payments next year, and most certainly it's going to affect our cash flow um, and our ability to um, fund the budget next early next year. And, and the cash flow is a serious consideration because without, the, without a reserve fund and uh, reduced special purpose funds not being able to borrow from the SPRF or the fire hydrant because they've, they've gone into the reserve fund, we are reducing options that we have to borrow from. And we're talking about not only this year, but future years. Yes, sir. Okay. And then on when do you think the controller have a better handle on the impact of ERIP on our uh, salaries and cash flow? How much time? Uh, we, we've been talking with the CAO on that now. They're doing a bottom-up. We're trying to do a, a top-down to see where things are going. But my understanding is that there are still discussions on who is actually going to be retiring. Okay, so we're, we're another month or two away from that. We should be in the next couple of weeks. We'll have a better handle. Uh, I believe the next group of folks that will be leaving to ERIP is, uh, would be February 13th, and then they'll be going monthly thereafter. Uh, I believe the next group is roughly about 350 to 400 uh, individuals. And basically, hopefully, to have a better sense of you're pushing out more general funded folks versus the special funded so we can try to maximize some of our savings. Is, is the slow up on the ERIP uh, numbers also impacting our uh, operational plans? It, it certainly is. Certainly, uh, as departments have come forward in trying to address the remaining shortfalls, you know, the big question they have is, you know, we don't know exactly when people will leave, um, whether people are going to continue to to basically opt out. Um, so they're they're sort of this been part of our our struggles over the last couple of weeks, um, not knowing uh, the full extent and impact of the Europe positions. Well, as we, we talk with the CAO and we go through and, and, and really start defining um, when it's going to be general fund people leaving, uh, when airports, harbor, uh, rec and parks, library people are going to be leaving, when special purpose fund people are going to be leaving, uh, all of that is going to be affecting, uh, impacting what the savings are on the general fund. But we don't uh, have that right we, now. we don't have that right now. We're, we're trying to figure that out. Okay, thank you very much. We'll move that report, um, note and file. Okay, item number five is a city treasury report relative to the city of Los Angeles investment policy <laughs> and related investment program approval. Great. Could we do uh, bring five, six, and seven up and do six and seven first and then... Sure. Uh, the sixth is basically the Treasurer's Investment and Cash Management Report for the month ending September 30th. And item seven is 
the uh, investment and cash management report for the month ending October 31st. Yes, yeah, so if you give us an overview on uh, six and seven as to where our uh, cash management, and then we'll get to item five, which may take a little bit more discussion. Okay, good afternoon, Julia DeFore, City Treasurer. And with me, I have Tom Juarez, who is our Senior Investment Manager. I uh, would like to give you uh, – available to address any questions you have about these specific reports, but would like to bring you current on our philosophy and strategy going forward. Uh, I think it's important, although the markets have calmed a bit, uh, we are not – we don't feel we're out of the woods yet. We are still taking a very, very conservative approach. Uh, in fact, in our budget submission, and, and I will tell you today that because of some of the cash flow issues we just heard uh, the controller report about, the percentage of general fund as part of the general pool has reduced from approximately 16 percent last year to about 11 percent this year, which means that we've had to reduce our general fund interest projections by about $7 million. We're hoping that we'll see some recovery in the next few months, and I know one thing we are going to be reinstating is our securities lending program. Now that the markets have settled and we see who some of the counterparties are going to be and that they're stable, this was another way that we can lend our securities in a secured environment for a fee and get some additional revenue. Uh, I, it is not realistic to think that unless there is – I can't even imagine a scenario where we'll be back to our original $19.8 million for the general fund this fiscal year. It, the, the economy has been bad. It's affected us. We've done as well as we can. But the reality is the general fund is shrinking, and that's where we get the earnings. I don't know, Tom, do you want to say? Let me just ask you that cycle. You're saying this, the general fund is shrinking, so it's less money to invest, which brings in less interest on the investment. So for that's the, the cycle fund. for the that's general the cycle. The, now the majority of the earnings that we're making are going to non-general fund because the non-general fund participants make up the majority, a vast majority of the pool now. Okay. Now the other issue is, is there, other than the general fund growing, are there other techniques or tactics we have to somewhat uh, uh, impact that or reverse the trend from that 19 million projected down to 11? Is there any other things we could or should be doing? Well, we are looking at some possible legislative changes. It would not be a, a quick fix, but it's more longer term view. Are there some things that we can do legislatively that would give us more latitude to invest in a little longer term of securities? We can do that to a certain extent at the local level by extending the pool uh, from our five years that is government mandated to having the city council approve something longer. But these are only little steps that we can take. I don't know if there's anything else that we're doing. No, again, Tom Juarez, Senior Investment Officer. Um, again, as the Treasurer mentioned, it's, it's a very delicate economy, a delicate atmosphere for investing. And to remain prudent, we, we've We've taken the approach where, you know, instead of just going out and trying to boost the yield, if you will, and going after the highest yielding investments, um, which has just kept us out of the out of the fire to this point anyway, um, we remain very cautious and and keep the ship steady here. Um, but again, as the treasurer mentioned, other than possibly investing a little further out on the yield curve where there has higher interest rates. Um, there's really not a whole heck of a lot of, you know, more that we can add at this point. Good. Do we have any sense on the whether we're going to be on the same track throughout this fiscal year? Do we see anything in the near or distant future that's going to change these trends as relates to the investment the portfolio? Based on what I just heard about uh, challenges with this, the revenues coming in, I don't see any improvement this fiscal year. I just want to know, um, this is item five, right? Uh, no, item six, six and seven, seven first. What about five? What we're going to get to that in just a okay. second. Okay, cool. Six and five. Paul, you got anything on six and seven? Yeah, I know the explanation is that the general fund went down, but the, the difference in the projections and what's coming in seem 
so dramatic. Um, I wonder how how we we wound up this far off because even our general fund doesn't seem like it's it's off by a similar ratio. Well, the the general interest rate environment also declined significantly. Uh, the okay. Feds have been holding interest rates between zero and 0.25 percent on the short term. Uh, the five year is about what, two two odd percent, as opposed to four last year. Okay, so that's the missing piece. Thank you. But I would say the majority of it is, as the Treasurer mentioned, the decline in the fund participation from 16 percent to 11.5 percent on a five billion odd dollar portfolio. You're going to have a significant uh, drop. But it was all interest. It was interest rate related as well. Thank you. We'll note and file uh, and move items six and seven, and then we'll go to item five. Uh, before you make your presentation, Mr. Dr. Williams, you have a comment, uh, a card on item five. My Clyde Williams, El Sereno, Northeast LA. I'm quite concerned regarding the bond ratings and what's going to happen for the upcoming bonds because this should be an investment policy. I tried to go through some of the information available, but it's a question as to can we keep AA ratings in the future with the given deficit? And it's not just California or L.A., it's also in Texas and Louisiana. They're having the same problem. The bond ratings are going to go down because there's just not enough revenue. DWP has emphasized that they need a substantial increase in their ECAF just to maintain the bond ratings at AA. So as part of the policy, I would highly recommend that you incorporate what the cash flow, what the rate of returns are going to be, and the impacts upon the bond ratings for the next five years. Because there may be deficits, but if you have a bond devaluation, there's going to be substantially more of a deficit, say, in 2014. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, Joey, if you could start on your presentation on number five. The thing that I asked you as you go through it, I couldn't figure out when reading it what we were trying to solve and what fell apart. And so if you can kind of incorporate in your conversation what we are confronted with, what's the failure of the current system, and what we're trying to solve with these recommendations. Uh, uh, good afternoon again. There's nothing that has failed. Typically, the investment policy would come on an annual basis to City Council. We had submitted uh, a draft policy in 2006 that we couldn't get scheduled for committee. Uh, looking at the environment, uh, there have been enough changes in the state code that I thought it prudent to update the policy, one. And two, there was something that I thought that was in concept a good idea, but I thought the execution could be better. And that was the concept of the Investment Advisory Committee. Now, the committee came about in 1986 uh, as a result of uh, a study commissioned by the City Council by Deloitte, Haskins and Sells, and now Deloitte, when there were some issues with uh, Far East Bank and an investment with Far East Bank when um, former Mayor Bradley sat on its board. Uh, the challenge with what was recommended is that the Investment Advisory Committee consisted of people by virtue of their title, not by virtue of their background or experience to be an investment advisory committee. So that's one, the one basic thing I'm trying to correct today. I would like to reinstate the investment advisory committee with the criteria that are outlined in the report, so people who would have background. And it's not so much for today, but it's building the infrastructure for the city's future. Right now, we have uh, very, very experienced investment officers, and I think because of the economy, we may have them at least for a year or two more. But when the economy turns around and with our compensation structure, I'm not assured that we could get the same quality 
inexperienced and investment officers. So by having an investment advisory committee that consists of experts to advise the treasurer and the city on investments, I, I just thought it would be prudent. But let me ask you, is the current ICE, what is it, IAC functional? Is it currently yeah, it meeting? It hasn't met since 2005. Mm -hmm. It was at that time the city auditor had a management audit, and it was found to be a, uh, a Brown Act kind of committee. And for the years from 1986 until 2005, it had met pretty much on a quarterly basis as far as I could determine, well, a monthly or quarterly basis. Uh, the other challenge was that uh, the committee by name was the CAO, it was the controller, that level, and the committee, uh, generally the attendees would be a lower level analyst type. Uh, and again, people who were not really versed in investments to the extent I can remember one of my first meetings at the city, I had to explain the difference between a bond and and uh, equity or a stock. So that's, it hasn't met for a while. I think we should meet. I think it would just provide some additional transparency. I think it would be a good time to see who out there may want to volunteer to be on this kind of committee and frankly allow city council to have someone other than me to, to bounce ideas off of. But, but uh, one of the things I was wondering in reviewing your report, the committee that you're proposing, you could do that on your own as far as advice? Well, if I can make an amendment from, from I mean, before. let me just finish. You can do that without disposing of the current ICA, IAC, okay. You could do that on your own by creating an environment where people can come forward to assist you and giving you advice. And if something is non-functional in the IAC, then I think it would be something where the council can figure out how to make that more functional. I'm, let me just say my concern, and I, I gave it the three read tests, and when I didn't understand it at the third time, I went to item six. But the dilemma is I couldn't figure out what we were trying to solve, and the concern I have is on any of these matters, that if the CAO and CLA aren't involved, I don't. I just have a concern that they we put that responsibility on them as oversight, and if they're not involved, or we are now going in the direction without their participation, I just have a little concern as to the continuity and things that we're asking them to do. Almost everything else financial, but they're not playing a role in this. And so, okay, and I'll, if I may address your concern mm -hmm. first. Um, I made a, a, a distinction between oversight and advisory because of the fiduciary responsibility mm -hmm. uh, of the state code through the city council and your delegation to me. Um, you know, I, that was one of the challenges that I had when I first came to the city. The then IAC thought that it had the power to direct the city treasurer on doing investments, and that just legally is, is not that's not reality. Um, no problem, and, and the ad hoc committees, I had thought to keep the ad hoc committees, which could meet on an as-needed basis, the members of the current stated IAC. And then that way, if they're ad hoc committees, we don't have the, all the notice requirements. If we have to get together quickly, we can do so uh, and, and talk about the finances. Um, no problem with if that would be your uh, choice to have uh, CLA and CAO as members, I would probably request that they be ex officio, so they are members of the committee, but just unless they have investment experience, it, it, it becomes difficult. Okay. Let me ask you, what was the RFP that you wanted to go out on and get, what, an investment expert? Uh, the Well, we already have the uh, investment expert on, on on board, and that was an RFP that went out, I think they're in their third and final year now, that's okay. Candler Asset Management, which is the the uh, contracted investment advisor. Okay, when you mentioned on page two about the RFP on the uh, second paragraph. Yes. Now that's already happened? Yes. And, and it, that it, position's that, on board? Yeah, that has been, um, that has never lapsed. 
Okay. And that's Chandler Asset Management, and they, we actually have gone out for an R, uh, RFP twice, and they won the second time as well. So you're saying the way the original uh, IAC was constructed or the way they operated when you came on board, that the direction that they were providing on input on uh, basically investments, what, violated the charter or? Violated state code. The because, state code. Because it's, it can be advisory, and, the, and advisory means, you know, you get all the input, but then as the fiduciary and – and the person to, to whom the city council has delegated investment authority, I have to be accountable and make the final decision. I can't say, you know, someone told me to make this decision that perhaps violates the state code. And it go, all goes to the prudent investor standard that is in the state code. Okay. And when you list these five criteria for selection, are th does the person have to meet all of these or a portion? No, no, one or more. One or more. Okay. And these are um, the first five are currently what county treasurers, uh, you know, that that's the law. And I just thought it, it's some basic objective criteria that's already in the state code. I added the last two because our portfolio is so big. And then uh, so someone who actually has hands on managed a portfolio or who's been an advisor to a portfolio of a significant size. Okay. And then explain to me on the security lending program, what are the changes and what are the issues there? There, the, there are really no changes there. It's been uh, approved by this council since the early 90s. I put a hold on it when we had the disruption in the market when we had a lot of the investment companies who otherwise would have purchased uh, or been participants in this program, they were going out of business. I couldn't validate, you know, what their rating was. Now we've had some more stability. Uh, we can work actually with the bank to limit the number of counterparties or people on the other side of the transaction. The bank actually holds our security, so these other companies never have access and never can take our securities, it's held with a third-party safekeeper. Okay, so that stands pat. Yeah. I think is in the policy is a, is a requirement of what charter that you publish a policy for as investment? The, the, the charter. It used to be a state code, but that sunset when the state mandate went by the wayside and the state didn't want to pay us anymore. So that requirement is now sunset at the state code, but it still remains in our charter. Um, they would come before the council. Oh, and that was what the change I was going to make from the floor. Um, I would like to make the recommendation and have the the members approved by the council and the mayor. And the ethics commission and all that. And the the whole thing. Paul, let, let me ask you this: uh, If in approving, if we were to approve the investment policy. The thing I'm concerned about, and I still think it needs to be cooked a little more, mm -hmm. is the IAC membership and how they become members and how they interact with city staff and people that we rely on from the council. And so what, what I would like to recommend is that we approve the policy as you propose it, the investment policy, that we also approve the city security lending program but that we asked you and the CAOCLA to address recommendations two and three and come back with something more flushed out as it relates to the membership, how they come about, what the working relationship is, what their responsibilities are, and how the council has a role. And certainly, I'd like to see some placement of the uh, CAOCLA as a, as a party to this. Now, on your recommendations, people like the, tra the fi Department of Finance, the controller, are no longer a player in this. And I Not necessarily. Okay. If, um, for instance, I, I know that the director of the Office of Finance has these, some of these qualifications. I know, but I'm saying but there's no guarantee that Correct. by position they're there now. Correct. So by these qualifications, they may or may not be. Correct. So I think we need some assessment from the COCLA if we create this, then how do we make sure that we're not losing our internal expertise? And if it's done by selection, not by position, 
they could very much not be a party to this. And so I think those are the things I'd like to see fleshed out, as I just don't have a comfort level right now as to looking at uh, recommendation two and three, but certainly I think we should approve your policy and, and, and also the city security lending program and ask if the CEO what timing would we need to flush out the, this whole issue two and three. It should be probably about 30 days. I mean, I'll get with um, CLA as well. Um, uh, I think we need to make some changes to the to the structure as it currently is, and yeah. and hopefully it, I, I don't think it'll take us that long. I, I, I'd have to sit down with yeah, CLA see where they are. Make, I think on the structure by position, I would not like us to get moving all of a sudden. Somebody raised their hand from the controls office saying I got eliminated unnecessarily. So I think we need to work all that out so there's some agreement of those who have been on the committee before if they're not going to be if they're not going to be selected by criteria that we know all that ahead of time. Council member, if I could add, if it is by position, it needs to be the position. That's so well, I think that's something you guys could work out in the discussion because I think most of that stuff starts off that way, mm -hmm. and then it ends up, like you said, with uh, people that are substitutes. But again, I, I can understand your concern about having expertise in those areas, and I think that's important. Uh, and not, and, and even if the person. Uh, I think with, that uh, is in position may not have it. There may be somebody more credible inside the department that has that expertise. But I think we need to work all those details out. Yeah, it's, it's a valid point. I also requested from Piper Tech uh, because that's how old this. It was actually t typed on it's a type writer. Is it sit down? The the, uh, the actual uh, council action that created this. There there were some other things that perhaps at the same time we can clean up. Oh yeah, I think that's pretty the whole old, purpose. Yeah. We can look at that and, and like I said, we'd move the, the uh, investment policy and we'd move the city security lending program to council for approval. And we ask that in 30 days that the CAO, CLA, and the treasurer come back and address items two and three and, and also looking at prior CF numbers and such that may need to be cleared up. At yeah, we can get that clear. Now, I actually want to raise one point on the investment policy that um, we like to work out with a controller, and that's um, E, and it has to do with credit requirements, maximum securities, maximum concentrations. It has to do with the reserve funds. Um, now, where are you referencing? Uh, this is page nine. It, it, it's basically, it speaks to the fact about um, using a longer term investment horizon where we can. Mm -hmm. uh, which I think is good, but I just want to make sure that we remain within um, our our bond uh, criteria and so forth. Uh, so okay, can, can that be addressed on its way to council? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, it can. Okay. We can and do that. securities lending is fine. All right. Okay, so we'll do that and address that uh, issue on the CAO's concern about the investment policy and route to council, and we'll have 30 days back on items two and three. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Ready for item 11? 11. The CO report relative to the 2009-10 second construction projects report. Uh, the um, Information Technology and Government Affairs Committee on December 15th recommended approval. Alma Gibson is here from our office. Hello, good afternoon. Good yes, Alma Gibson with the CAO's office. Our office is recommending or submitting to you again the second construction projects report for this fiscal year. And it basically consists of various funding adjustments related to the city's construction projects that are necessary in order to keep these projects on track. Um, these financial adjustments are primarily reimbursements from special funds, that is general obligation funds, MICLA financings, and Quimby funds, for example. Of the $22.6 million that's recommending and funded in, in transfers and appropriations, excuse me, in this report, approximately $11 million is for the estimated staff cost reimbursements for this fiscal year. Um, this consists of approximately $8 million for direct costs, which will be reimbursements to the uh, city's departments, as well as 
three million for indirect costs, which will consist of a reimbursement to the general fund. Um, again, this is for staff costs for the public and police administration building, for example, for the Prop F fire and animal facilities program, for the Prop G seismic prom program, for the Prop Q citywide public safety program, and for Prop DD library bond program. Now, these positions um, for these programs have been authorized by resolution, and funding is for services provided by city staff, which includes program management, uh, project control, which is monitoring of expenditures, property acquisition, including relocation assistance, and specialized support, which includes ITA services. In addition, this report recommends approximately $9.8 million in transfers and appropriations within various cities' funds. And they, this is, for example, of this amount, um, $5.9 million is for the reprogramming of residual funding from various recreation and parks projects to be set aside to address um, shortfalls. And then finally, about $1.7 million is recommended for appropriations to GSD to perform construction work on various projects. And they're related to police station projects, fire station projects, street services yards, as well as recreation and park projects and CRA projects. Um, we have representatives here uh, for lots of these projects if you have any additional questions. Let me just ask, uh, starting off, in the financial impact when we say this, uh, these transfers have no additional impact on the general fund, what are the short and long-term impacts currently on the general fund? In, in other words, we're not going to... I know you're not going to ask for more. What I want to find out is... We're not going to ask for more, exactly. Okay, what's the in the program that we're currently asking? How many dollars are current? Because what sometimes when we read the CAO's reports, it says it doesn't have a general fund impact, and then it goes on and says, but we have 15 people that were in the budget. And you say, well, it doesn't have an additional impact. What is the impact on the general fund absent, as you state here, no additional? What is the current impact on the general fund for all these projects yes um i don't have that information um all you know but, but the impact but these are is, these are positions that are funded is, during right. the fiscal year right okay and this is again a reimbursements that are going to be coming from special but funds they're reimbursing to the general fund exactly to general fund department budgets as well as you know, but all the, 22 million isn't. No, it's only 11 million dollars that's being reimbursed from the special funds to the general fund. Okay. So we so don't the know. The budget for mm -hmm. this year for 2009-10 has included that amount as the related cost reimbursement revenue. If the report is not approved, then we would be out of balance with the program revenue for so, this year in terms okay. of the staff reimbursement. Okay, but the thing is, on the sta these are reimbursements. But Correct. again, do we know what the impact of the general fund is totally by these 20-some projects or whatever? No, what the fiscal impact is reporting on is the staff reimbursements. That's the $11 million. Because what I'm concerned about, as we keep hearing the stories about the general fund and the impact and the loss of revenue, that if we, it's one thing that they're being reimbursed, the other side of the coin is do any of these projects need to continue if we have a shortfall? I know you don't like to hear me say that, <laughs> but the issue is with general fund, which we're trying to recoup, do all of these projects need to move forward with an impact on the general fund? Yeah, we'd have to look at that. I believe you're talking about operation and maintenance funding for new facilities once they're completed. Yeah. And, and I think that's, that's a big issue because we don't want a situation like the jail. You build it and you can't fill it, things of that nature. I mean, so the general fund is where we're, where we're bleeding from, and we're just trying to get an idea. Do all these things need to be moving forward? Yes, we get an impact positively on the reimbursement, but we're also spending or expected for the life of the project to spend general fund money that we may or may not have. We do, as a, uh, in real general information in the three-year forecast, mm -hmm. provide an estimate of the operating and maintenance costs for new facilities. Um, as it shows out in the uh, supplemental information to the Budget and Finance Committee, it's just one line item, but we do have uh, detailed information on it, and we'll be happy to okay, and what about update it. The other side of it, what about MICLA debt service? Do we have a figure on how much 
debt service we're paying on NICOLA funded projects in this group of projects? We do have information um, that we're preparing and we're very close to uh, submitting a detailed NICOLA report on municipal facility projects overall, the ones that are completed, the ones that are in progress, mm -hmm. and future ones. Um, we know that we're about $1.5 billion in authorized uh, MICLA, and about 1.3 has been spent. Um, and I, I don't recall off the top of my head with the debt service on it. Yeah, I think we, the last time I checked, we were somewhere north of $200 million a year on debt service for MICLA. Yeah, I think it's about $180, $90 million mm -hmm. this year, but that includes um, equipment and capital. Mm -hmm. And again, that's general fund money that we're paying the debt service, which they're telling us is is dropping drastically as we sit here. Right. <coughs> so in terms of the 6%? You know, we, we, we haven't maxed out on the 6%. We've maxed out on the dollars that we don't have this to pay for the issues. That's, that's what I'm concerned about. And, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, for this particular report, the only MECLA that's being requested is for the police administration building? Right, and it's a reimbursement of the staff cost for the administration of that program. I think the, if I remember correctly, I only saw Mikla mentioned early on, yeah. uh, item two. Recommendation two. Okay. So overall, we have right now 29 active MICLA projects. This report would provide financial recommendations for those projects that need a financial adjustment where GSD is doing work and we need to reimburse them or where we're reimbursing staff costs. Mm -hmm. These um, monthly and sometimes quarterly construction projects report don't discuss the entire inventory of projects. Mm -hmm. I think the, if this is not this report or the last one. We had a discussion in personnel committee about some of these projects over time do not diminish in size as it relates to personnel, even though the project may hit three quarters finished or two thirds finished, we're still running with the same number of people that we had when we initiated it. And that was another con concern as to whether we are paying for positions well beyond uh, the timeline of when they should be reducing their overall numbers as the project comes to a conclusion. And so that that's another issue that I'm concerned with. Do you have anything? That is happening. Yeah, I do. Good uh, afternoon. You have, and we've gone through this pretty close in my office here. I'm uh, okay with certain parts, but not with others. And let me ask you a couple of quick questions. Uh, I'm from CD11. Okay, page two of attachment four. If you have Palm Rec Center, 9,000, um, uh, it said it was leftover. Leftover for what? And then the Penmar Park, it's 25,000. And we could use money in, in Penmar Park. I go buy it every day. It, it needs all the help you can get. Uh, then you got 16,000 from Stoner Rec Center. It's another one that I'm in the middle of, and we're actually going to go forward with a uh, skateboard park there. The Venice pool is okay, the amount there, but the big last one is the Mar Vista uh, Gardens uh, Child Care Center. Um, we have a huge issue in Mar Vista at the place, and I want to reprogram that money for a teen center. So I'm just wondering with these projects, if you and I could get back on it or break it down or, or answer me right now some of the questions that I've just asked. Okay. You start with the big one, which is the Mar Vista Garden money, which is $417,000. Okay. Bernice Hollins, Office of the CAO. If I could provide an overview first um, of our process for identifying these funds. Um, we work collaboratively um, both with the Department of Recreation and Parks and um, Bureau of Engineering um, to identify um, projects um, that were reflected in these appropriations that had already been accomplished, um, either with these funds or by other funding sources. Um, these projects were um, identified as, um, I'm sorry, these funds were identified as no longer necessary 
for the original purpose for which these monies were appropriated. Um, that means that there may be additional work required at the site, but it was not part of the original project scope. Um, with respect to um, Mar Vista Child Care Center, um, we were just advised that you're looking to um, reprogram those funds for a teen center. That is something that we can um, work with your office um, to look at addressing, um, and we would not be opposed to um, not approving that transfer at this time. Well, that's, that's, that's beautiful here because it's a desperate situation in there, and we have a lot of gang issues that continue to develop there, and that's why that would be a value. I'm just wondering with some of the smaller ones there, um, because my office wasn't involved, you know, you said between this department and that department, but my own office takes an interest in these things, and so it kind of caught me a little uh, off guard, so to speak. And, of course, the bigger the dollar figure, the more obviously I, I'm, I'm uh, focusing on it. And that's where the Palms Rec Center, the Penmore, and the Stoner Rec. Has anybody looked at that? Yeah, just to let you know, again, as Bernice said, for all three of those, they were actually allocated to other projects which are now completed. For example, Palms was a child care center. Stoner was the Stoner Pool, which is completed. You talked about the other project. We have a Stoner, which is a skate park. We're working with Recreation and Parks, and they have additional Quimby funds yeah. to complete that project. So with the Quimby funds, that will be fully funded, even with the expansion. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm happy, especially with the Mar Vista Gardens discussion. Thank you. Well, let me just ask one other question. Dealing with the Public Works Trust Fund, have we looked at the status of that and how it's impacted as it relates to uh, my understanding is that uh, uh, we have significant number of, bor of unauthorized, I guess, uh, reservations for borrowing. And I've, if I understand the process, it also – limits the controller to some degree if that fund is diminished as it relates to how she balances the books and things of that nature. So where are we on the Public Works Trust Fund? At this point, uh, Lyndon Salvador from Office of Accounting, um, Department of Public Works. Um, at this point, we are looking at the daily cash flows requirements of the Public Works Trust Fund. And since um, they started working on this project, we have um, made a reservation, loan reservation for this 3.7 million. So it's, it's, it is considered daily in our cash flows, and this time we can uh, land the 3.7 million. And that's to what projects? projects? There are two. There's actually four projects. Um, there's the Peck Park Canyon Extension Project, the LA River Parkway West Valley Phase One Project, the North Water Park River Vista Expansion, and the Sunny Nook River Project. Okay, when you say borrow, how are those funds going to be paid back, and what's the timeline? Um, we have Lori Hancock from our office to explain that. The timeline, um, these are uh, Prop 84 and Prop 50 um, grants. They are fully reimbursable. We need these funds to cash flow those those projects. They have, because there are four different projects, we have are asking that a um, revolving account be established to cash flow them. And the last project should be completed in 2012. Okay, but now because the controller uses those funds on an annual basis, how quickly can those pro those proposition funds get back into the account so that we're not depleting that flexibility that they use for cash flow for the city's budget? We're asking for $3.7 million. In actuality, the projects and the dollars, actually the projects go beyond that, but um, this would be cash flowing $7.2 million in, in state grants. So we would need for this to be revolving so that once we get a contractor's bill, it would be submitted to the state, and those funds would then come back to the revolving cash flow. We can look at uh, the projects that are completing um, as they complete to pull them out and return some of these funds, but we would need to keep at least a million dollars in that account through 2012. Through, through 2012? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Let me just uh, ask on the CAO. On the, the issue here, and this is something that we've dealt with before, and looking at our um, general fund concerns is that we really need to find out how many, how much general fund dollars are uh, captured in, in this project, these projects. Also, where we are on Mikola uh, because of the debt service. And then also to look at the issue of the um, Public Works Trust Fund to make sure that uh, we've basically are reducing the repayment 
timeline to the to the uh, the max that we that we can, as opposed to them having they need a million that we're not sitting there with several million on their revolving fund. But we need those three things looked at on this uh, as this progresses to council. So we're fully aware of the impact overall in the general fund. And even though the uh, Public Works Trust Fund, uh, our concern there would be the uh, cash flow problem of the controller using those funds to balance our books, whether those funds are available. Okay. okay. All right. So we'll, we'll move that item with those three requests uh, as it comes to council. Yeah, and the, in the amending of the 417 for the Marvista Gardens for a teen center. I will reflect that they're doing that. Thank you. Okay, item 12 is a motion, Weston Perry, relative to amending the city's agreement with the Independent Cities Finance Authority in order to allow the ICFA to issue tax exempt bonds to assist nonprofit agencies to acquire mobile home parks located within the city. We have staff on this item. But he looks familiar. <laughs> My name is Michael Karsh. I'm with Ken Spiker and Associates. <laughs> and we represent the Independent Cities Finance Authority, which is asking for this change in the agreement that the city entered into in 1998 with the ICFA in order to be able for them to issue tax exempt bonds. We have met with the city attorney. We have worked with the housing department. We have worked out any kind of problems there were. It is limited only to mobile home parks. All of the loans that the finance authority would authorize for people seeking to buy out the parks, all of that would have to retain the mobile home parks as residential property for the people in those parks. It would maintain the standards within the park and they would also uh, uh, guarantee that the, that the existing uh, tenants would not be kicked out. Uh, they would follow prevailing wage on any kind of construction projects that might be involved. And they have a, a fairly well-established program throughout California of making these loans, but they have not been able to issue them in the city of L.A. because of the way that the document was written in 1998. Uh, the proposal, the revision to that agreement is before you, and we would hope that the committee and the council would uh, uh, would vote approval of that. If you have any questions, yes, in '98, what was the reason that it was omitted? Was there a rationale or just an oversight or what? Well, I I, I don't know. Um, it was clearly uh, it was supposed to allow for tax exempt bonds. Uh, there was some change made apparently uh, well, since I presented it to committee at the time I remember what that was and there was no dispute at all but apparently a change was made so when the finance authority began looking at when their bond council began was looking there, at what was they changed could, that it was in the original proposal that yes. you could sell bonds for yes. the trailer parks, but it was changed in yes. the process okay Yes, in the city process. Yes, and they would not allow any uh, tax exempt bonds to be issued in the city of LA for projects in the city of LA by the finance authority. That's what is before you is to make clear that they can do that. Okay. But it's all, but it's limited to mobile home parks. What, what's the, is, if any liability to the city? There is no liability to the city. In the uh, in the bonds from ICFA, they say that. Uh, the Series A bonds are special limited obligations, uh, and they are not a debt, not a pledge of the full faith and credit of the state of California or any of its political subdivisions. Neither are they liable on the Series A bonds, nor are the Series A bonds payable out of any funds or properties other than the pledged revenues and the issuance of the, of the bonds are based on. So the city has no liability. Also, yes, the city, uh, it doesn't impact anything as it relates to their debt. That's or their correct. rating or anything else. That's correct. So this is a nonprofit working directly yes. with this association, and the funds they retrieve from the sale of those bonds are used for that specific purpose. That's correct. Okay. So if they default, it's between it's, the it's between the owner and the finance authority, okay. and uh, they always will uh, conform 
on the mobile home parks that they do support to whatever local regulations there are. So if there's a local regulation to keep the keep the low income uh, tenants in the park, then that shall be followed. Okay, so that that's something that's part of what an MOU or yes, yes it is. And uh, any issuance would have to be approved by the housing department. Uh, that would have a TEFRA hearing, and uh, it's a fairly open process. I can't think of anything that would be objectionable to it. Any other questions? And there are 62 mobile home parks in the city, so there's some hope for that. Yeah, I have a couple in my district. Um, yes, you do. What's your take on that? I think they're good for your um, for at least an effort to be made on uh, on those two parks. Uh, your two are on Pacific Coast Highway. Yeah. Very expensive area. There is some temptation uh, to sell and to, and to redevelop. Uh, if we did have a nonprofit owner who could go into that. Uh, that person would still be bound by whatever uh, rent control and uh, tenant protection that the city currently has. Thank you. Paul, okay, we move that item and concur with the HCD report. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. I'm number 14 was continued from the, our October 5th uh, meeting, and it's uh, a DWP report relative to financial policies of the uh, Department of Water and Power. Uh, we also have a CO report relative to the uh, financial policy comparison of CRA, um, Harbor Airport, uh, and DWP. I was just one, Greg. No, this is a 2008 summer study that's here. Good. <laughs> oh, we're still on schedule. <laughs> so we we still deliver. <laughs> Let me ask Dr. Williams to come up before the staff makes their presentation, and you have a card, Dr. Williams, still here. No, sit sit down. I think he's gone. So he's gone. Okay. Why don't you start the presentation? Todd Bowie with the City Administrator Office. Uh, before you is a compilation of the cities, the proprietaries, and the CRA's uh, financial policies. In our review, uh, we believe that uh, each of the agencies has complied with the, uh, the intent of, of Council in terms of developing and, and bringing forward their financial policies. And in the course of doing our review, we feel that there are a few areas where um, we need to as the city, maybe look at some more financial policies and, and maybe strengthening and uh, bringing forward uh, specifically in here a, a performance management policy and uh, as well as updating our policies to reflect a lot of the changes that have occurred since the last time this document was updated. Let me just ask you, that was one of my concerns in that looking at the CAO report, particularly in the area of debt management, you made several recommendations but it didn't appear that we were directing anything to happen. Are those going to happen, or how does that work? They, they, were, uh, they were included, I believe, as, uh, as suggestions uh, more than uh, recommendations, but I think also Natalie could probably speak to that a little bit. If I may, actually, this was, report was geared more as a sort of a, a status comparison of existing policies. Mm -hmm. uh, we are going to be kicking off a, a review of all of our policies where we would have the opportunity to uh, forward some recommendation to you. Uh, as Todd has mentioned, we, we're looking at sort of a performance uh, management type policy. Uh, certainly we want to go back and, and look at all of the policies that we had drafted several years ago, make sure that uh, we strengthen them and actually enforce them, um, as well as add any other new policies, such as the budget civilization um, fund policy that still has to be drafted. So, um, there are a number of things that we're, we're, we hope to get for, before you in the next couple of months. Uh, this report was more just kind of a, a status on comparing the different policies and just providing a few suggestions. Let me mention uh, my concern because we beat you to death about bringing this forward. But the, <laughs> the issue that I'm concerned about is that we not get to the point once this is done, not only for, the, for us but the proprietaries, that we don't look and find it all fell through the cracks and five years from now, we got to start all over again. So what I was looking for, and in, in particularly in suggestions or recommendations, is that we, and I think it's important that the CAO is going to take on these responsibilities, but we've not mentioned what our expectation of proprietary departments, and they took forever to respond to us. 
And so these are things that I would hope that if this is the first cut at it, how do we then have recommendations in here that make sure that the proprietaries are keeping up with their policies, that we're making comparisons, and as the report reflected, we're learning from each other. If they propose something, they're doing it, and it would help the city's general fund. How are we going to uh, basically cross uh, uh, with each other and understand what's going on? And so that's what I found mm -hmm. that was missing, that yet the key is general fund departments are, you know, the CAO is going to make sure these things happen, but we're not assured that CRA, Harbor, DWP are going to follow suit, because if I read this report as it's written, I would say it's interesting information and I'd move on to my other 30 projects, but I wouldn't take it as a requirement to say keep up with the policies, keep informed, keep communicating with the CAO as to this cross-pollinization of ideas. So that's what I was looking for, is that if we've done it, gone this far, how do we take the next step to make sure this annual process is going to be inclusive of these four other departments? See, because we could beat on you every Monday. So the issue is... <laughs> And you do. Yeah. <laughs> Highly recommended. Yeah. yeah, I understand what you're saying, and I think uh, we we did kind of, we didn't uh, put that as a formal recommendation, in large part because um, to what extent can we direct, I guess, the uh, the proprietaries in terms of what they put within uh, their uh, financial uh, policies? But uh, I, I believe that. Yeah. Um, I mean, let me just stop you there. The fact is, is they told us that when we did the motion and said we couldn't ask them to tell us and it took mm -hmm. several years, but they have finally told us with their financial policies. And again, I would not like to have all this work come to pass that we look up and in two years we say we don't know what they're doing. Mm -hmm. So I think we that's what I need to find out is how do we call it, and we can accept this as a first cut, but how do we come back immediately to make sure that these debt policies that you've identified in each department have actually been acted upon. I think if, uh, we can uh, certainly. I can work with the uh, the financial folks and these other entities and uh, have discourse with them as to how uh, we might be able to facilitate that. Okay. But I mean, how do we? You're going to bring us back something that. I'd say uh, How do we do two, two, kind of two thoughts in my One, um, the mayor's office at, at one point, I don't know if they still are, are actively pursuing it, they had this finance cabinet which basically included all of the proprietaries and, and CO. Uh, that might be one way that we can um, ensure that the proprietaries and CRA um, maintain, um, strengthen, uh, and, and modify where necessary on a go-forward basis. Uh, the flip side is also our office can take a lead in coordinating uh, those those issues and, and concerns um, in the future. Okay. <laughs> so if we accept this as it is, then you're going to bring us back another report that makes shows us how that's going to happen. Basically, what we can bring back. There's two things we're going to bring back. One is our own. You know, city effort. policy. But this second is we can bring back a, a proposal on how to deal with basically the larger piece that basically includes the proprietaries. There's some sort of an annual requirement. Other issue I had a concern with is that you mentioned the recommendations on the debt policy. You also identified a comparison of how we deal with our our fee evaluation, and you've identified where they are doing things with fees, but maybe not as coherent as the CAO has laid out. That's another one that if we're talking about full cost recovery, I think we've had a couple of audits by the controller that reflected, at least I believe in the harbor, that at one time they didn't have a policy that dealt with leases and how they were leasing things with a, a, uh, a market strategy. So the points that you've brought up about uh, debt uh, policy, the points that you brought up about the uh, uh, addressing the uh, fee structures and the annual basis, those appear to be relevant for all departments. Again, but we do need to make sure that there's a process that we bring all this back to make sure they're all on the same line. So we can depend on you to do that for us? Yes. Okay. And then let we me won't just make it a summer my study last either. point out on page, uh, and Natalie's out there laughing at you, right? Yes, she is. <laughs> <laughs> on page, I think it's number, page five. I'm sorry, page nine. 
The one thing that I think we need as a committee is although there's a policy in place of telling us uh, the full cost of the issues, routinely our committee reports come out throughout the council without a financial impact statement. And that appears to be something that we need to go back to not only as we talked about motions including where financial resources are coming from, mm -hmm. but the financial impact statement would tell us not only the cost of this item, but what's the cost over the long term. And we do need to bring that policy back into reality and in making sure that each one of our reports, as it goes through council, people are fully aware of the short and long term impact, particularly of the general fund. I, I would agree. And, and we discussed that internally as we were looking at the report and, and how do we, uh, we've folded that in our in our fiscal impact statement but it hasn't always been very clear and we were discussing internally whether we continue to have that language in the fiscal impact statement or actually we break it out separately much like we do the debt impact statement and actually this financial policy you know complying something to the fact where we're just very direct and uh, whether or not it uh, complies with our our policies see i think that's where the, we put a lot of effort to create the policies the statement of whether it complies with the policy is very important and what the full impact. One of the things that MTA does that's different from the way we handle it, they actually put a statement in their financial impact that says what's the cost of the life of the project. So it's just not this year it's talking about. And then they turn it around and said if you don't do this, this is the ultimate result if you don't approve this. So it gives you both sides of the equation. No. Okay. Good afternoon. We'll move this item, but we'll ask you to come back. I'm sorry. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Suhaila Sajedian, Harbor Department, Debt mm -hmm. and Treasury Division. I just want to add for the record that Harbor Department establishes its first debt management policy in 2002, mm -hmm. which was approved by the Board of Harbor Commissioners in August 2002. Subsequent to City's uh, formulation of financial policies in 2005, we included our debt policy, we updated it and included it into the total financial policy package for the Harbor Department, which we took it to the board in September of 2008 and again took it to the board in April of 2009. So we've been working as a living document and updated. And according to the report from CAO's office, we plan to take it back to the Board of Harbor Commissioners to include the arbitrage rebate policy for the board. Well, thank you very much. Then you'll be the first to respond when Ray calls you then. Okay. <laughs> thank you. So we'll move this item to council uh, with the recommendations. We ask the CAO uh, to come back to us on the uh, lingering parts of how we create a citywide system with the proprietaries and CRA to ensure that these financial policies are updated and that we're learning from each other as it relates to the uh, uh, different annual policies and what effect. And I think the point you made in the report that not only that we identify the policies, but we also in the budget reflects when we're complying and then in the actual budget that we're compliance and then the reality of the spending plan that we're in compliance. Otherwise, the policies are just a nice document. Well, it, it, one other thing just to note that I will say, it, it will be um – We'll take it upon ourselves uh, and, and well with assistance from CLA and others is to basically go back, review these, strengthen them, add a few additional, but then also put these actually in ordinance because he's never made it in an actual ordinance and they were supposed to. Well, thank you very much. Any other? Nope. I think that's it. No other Last card. item. Meetings adjourned. Thank you. Oh, let me just say one thing before everybody goes. That, that. We have four meetings on the Budget Committee on the road. January 25th, CD6 will host a meeting at Van Nuys City Hall. Uh, February 22nd, CD5 will host a meeting at Hamilton High. On March 8th, uh, CD14 will host a meeting at El Sereno Rec Center. March 22nd, CD9 will host a meeting at their 9th uh, District Neighborhood City Hall. So those are our four meetings on the road. Hello. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you, sir. Okay.